Boom, what's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. Very excited to still be at COFES, the Congress on the Future of Engineering Software for our second annual partnership with them. We are now sitting down with Karen Kaswelch and Dr. Praveen Yadav. Hello, thank you for coming onto the show. Hi, how are you? We're very excited, we're very excited. Thank you. Yes, yes. There's so much to talk about with generative design and what you guys are doing with SciArt Software. We're really excited to unpack that. For those that don't know, Praveen has been doing, uh, he's, he's been working his way up to co-founder and CTO role at SciArt Software, three and a half years. Karen has been over a year now working her way up into the CEO role. And SciArt's doing awesome work. We're going to be unpacking that and what generative design actually means. Before we get there, let's learn about your journeys. How did you guys get excited about engineering software and teach us about your journey leading up to this point? All right, so I'll go first. Uh, why I am doing the engineering software? Uh, I started my career as a suspension designer for Tata Motors. Uh, this was back in uh, 2007, July of 2007. And uh, my problem with uh, being a designer was uh, there weren't any tools that would uh, allow me to perform analysis, uh, upfront analysis on the designs that I wanted to create for the vehicles that we were designing. And uh, as expected, my daily life was a lot of uh, hitting dead ends uh, without knowing how to sort of overcome them. Um, and there was a separate analysis group that I had to sort of uh, communicate with to sort of help me out with my design process. So I quit my job. I wanted to be an analyst because I like their job better than my job. Uh, so I came to University of Wisconsin uh, to pursue my graduate studies specifically to sort of understand the simulation engineering. Uh, and then uh, about six and a half years uh, into my PhD program, um, we created something that I thought would be a very useful tool to the design engineer who quit his job to come to grad school. And that's how I got involved in the SciArt software business. So I have a slightly different career path. Um, I have a mechanical engineering degree and I mean, I wanted to change manufacturing. So that was, that was my underlying, I wanna change manufacturing and make it you know, successful in the United States. So I came to, I went to General Motors and I was at GM for 24 years, mostly in the manufacturing side. So I ran a chassis shift at a, a GM truck plant. Um, I, I went to Asia and then I was a VP of purchasing for Allison Transmission. And uh, about 10 years ago, I moved on from GM and ended up running a software company and started getting exposed to engineering software. Now this was supply chain product costing software, but it did interact on the engineering side. So uh, uh, I have now been a member of, I've run or been number two in charge of four, five different startups. And uh, about a year, year and a half ago, Praveen, reached out and we started talking to each other and I was really interested in you know how to design for the future and we th I think generative design is really a key for the future whether it's for additive manufacturing or traditional manufacturing and I was so intrigued with what SciArt was doing that I wanted to come and, and be a part of the company and the journey. Oh man, the the origin stories are all are always very interesting. There's so many years of experience with your background, like 25 years or something of experience. That's crazy, or so. Or so. A little more than that. That's but or so, yeah, yeah, that's that's amazing, and that's a lot to actually be able to go and see all of the processes and also know the importance of what you're working on now. And Praveen, I also really enjoyed how you know when when you actually do have this really serious problem and you know that something needs to fill this fill the role, and then to be able to build it and go and bring it into the world so now let's 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 talk about this all right we we f we find ourselves as probably you know manufacturing like on a big history perspective manufacturing now more than ever we're just producing so many different complex goods we're designing them we're engineering them all the way this product life cycle management all the way from idea until it's disposal or recycling so as as a designer is 
figuring out how to take an idea and actually make it in the most effective way. What does this look like when you're using CAD and you're using all these different tools to try and like simulate adding, doing this generative design, running what it would be like if it had this or if it didn't have that, what the cost does, how the all the different engineering variables, how those get tweaked. Teach us about this on an abstract level. So from engineering perspective, like when I was designing in CAD, uh, the objective always was to sort of design parts that meet the basic specification of functionalities. So the basic specification of functionality for a suspension, for example, would be, um, or take an example of lower control arm, should be it should run at least 100,000 miles with certain specification over uh, load cycles. So that was the engineering challenge that I was trying to solve. And I'm using a very specific example, but it is scalable to any engineering design problem. Uh, how do I solve that challenge? Well, I design a part, basically, that fits within the specification of the loading parameters. And then the next challenge is, how do I make it cost efficient? So I have to remove material so that it can be made with the lightest possible uh, weight. It can be made of the li lightest possible weight that still meets all the engineering specification of running 100,000 cycles through different loading parameters. That's just the engineering challenge of it. Then there is a supply chain challenge of it, as how do I sort of manufacture that part repeatably for, say, 300 or 30,000 vehicles that are going to be manufactured every month. So then there is the manufacturing cost aspect to it. Then there is the assembly. Is this design made for assembly where uh, a line personnel can take this part and sort of fit it into the vehicle easily? Then you have to sort of understand the challenges of replacing it in field if and there ever occurs a situation where this part is under uh, failure and, and it has to be replaced. So there, all of these support, maintenance, costing aspects have to be sort of considered during the design process, early stage design process, as early as possible so that you don't have to redesign parts further down into the uh, life cycle of the product. So that's those are the challenges that I wanted to sort of uh, conquer, so to speak, for lack of a better term. Uh, as quickly as possible, as early as possible, so that I don't, I, there is minimum amount of rework required later in the validation stage. But uh, as we said, like there aren't sort of tools baked into which will sort of generate those design sort of, uh, what you might say, options, opportunities will give me sort of what different kind of designs look like if you have different kind of challenges. And, and, and that lack of that tool kind of sort of brought me to this uh, long, arduous journey that we've sort of, that has pretty much shaped my entire adult life, so to speak. <laughs> yeah. Now, okay, so when, when, you, when, you, when you're explaining this, 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 you know, it almost, it almost hurts a designer or engineer when something so far down the road ends up, yeah, and you have to, you know, re, re redesign it to, and, and you're giving this example of like something like maintenance. Is it easy to maintain? Is it easy to access in the assembly process? All of these questions, can it actually hit these milestones that you're looking to have it hit um, at the lowest weight and in the supply, all the variables of the supply chain? So then, how does with all of these variables at in enduring to compute how does how does the sciart how do you how does your software then make all of these kind of like simulations all these computes for possibilities and then see which ones are the best ones i'm going to i'm going to start yeah. by saying we're not doing all of that right now. So we're starting at the very beginning of that journey. So that is the end. We're starting right now at the very beginning, which is how do you design a part that, that in fact, how does a, a, an, an engineer with an undergraduate education who's less than a year from graduation sit down at his or her desk and design a part that has a very good chance of being successful 
all the way through the validation process. So that's the problem that we're solving right now. And as we evaluated and looked at all the tools out there, uh, most of them need more than a bachelor's degree to actually use. They're very expensive and they're not integrated with the main tool that that design engineer uses, which is his CAD program. So the, CAD, the design engineer is sitting at the CAD program and you want them to be able to generate ideas that have a much better chance of being successful because every iteration takes time and it's very expensive. And so that you, you want that design engineer to be able to explore options very early in the process while they're inside their CAD program so they're not going back and forth between different programs. And that's the problem we're trying to solve. Do you wanna? That is an accurate assessment uh, that yes, we're not trying to solve the entire sort of value uh, not today. Not yeah. today. Right. Version one. Yeah, Version exactly. one is not solving the entire sort of value chain and sort of bringing everything into the sort of design space exploration. We are specifically focused on uh, some of the early stage sort of design exploration parameters. Um, so functionality is a key parameter. Uh, to a certain degree, manufacturability is another parameter. Uh, uh, assembly is not sort of been sort of used as a parameter yet. Uh, costing of what features to sort of replace, add, uh, is not sort of manufacturing costing is not used as a parameter yet, but uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, functionality based on sort of stiffnesses, strengths, frequencies, part consolidation, that is baked into uh, our software as of today. And, and the idea is sort of take all of those sort of uh, uh, parameters, uh, functionalities and constraints, and provide a range of designs, like not just one design, like options. You, if you take all of those sort of parameters and give you just one design, that's not really giving you options. Like that's just telling you, well, I think this design is good enough. That might still fail at validation, but that's kind of sort of is, is sort of not, it's better than not using it at all, but still not sort of there from an early stage design concept perspective. So we're, trying to sort of provide multiple designs, each of which meet all of your constraints to a different degree, where now the engineers can make those decisions based on if one out of 10 part fails the validation test, there are still nine other options for you to try, yes. which were still developed early enough that you don't have to repeat the process sequentially. Okay, let me, okay. Let me, let me, see, let me see what I can do here. So. We take a a, 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 a a tool, we manufacture a tool that can then make it easier for young people with uh, just an, a, a pretty s solid couple years of, of engineering experience to be able to then go and and design multiple iterations of and use your platform for the generative design with you then have multiple they have multiple iterations, let's say ten of these. And so now, do they, do they, when they, when, so this is, this, this works directly with their CAD tool. Okay. And then when, when they're, um, let's take, let's take a part. What's a common part for, is it mostly automotive is a common one or, or a different assembly robot or maybe an arrow? Like what's, what's so let's make it easy. Yes. Okay. It can be an automotive part, uh, performance, uh, performance powertrain or performance vehicle. So think, uh, think uh, motorcycles, race cars, um, defense, aerospace, yeah. and even handheld tools. You know, it matters how, like a, like a drill, it yeah. matters how heavy it is. Yeah. So, uh, but, but to make it easy, let's talk about a bracket. Okay. Okay. Bracket. And let's talk about something that yeah. people can kind of almost visualize. The bracket that attaches an airplane seat to the floor. Those Okay, so let's just use that as, as our example. Okay, now, 
Yes. Okay. 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 So we take this this bracket that attaches the airplane seat to the floor, and now we're 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 basically we're trying to iterate on that to make it more efficient, more cost efficient, um, potentially uh, source the materials from safer and more ecologically friendly ways. All these different sorts of um, make the supply chain easier. So so then when we when we when we have a, a student that's using CAD and using your generative design software as well then they get they, they sort of make a first do they sort of make a first uh bracket an l bracket and then they kind of see uh how you help them uh with the other nine options and they kind of get to see that and then tweak it together so you have this seat bracket okay and what do you want as the passenger you want to know in a really hard you know, slow down of that airplane or really hard acceleration that the the bracket is going to hold tight. Okay. Yeah. And so there are forces, there's you have to meet a certain, you know, like if you have a really heavy passenger, you don't want the bracket to break. So there's weight forces, there's acceleration forces, there's all kinds of forces that that bracket has to withstand. And in the space. Like and, the and then you've got the space. Yeah. So what our software allows you to do is create, here's the maximum space, here's all the attachment points. Okay. okay? And here's all the forces that it needs to oh withstand okay. and then you hit a button and say go okay, it, okay. Like, well, like like literally that. yes <laughs> Okay, so you have the space, you have the attachment locations, and you have the forces at play, and then you hit a button, and then it simulates out all of the different ways that right. it could support that those forces and those attachment points and with different materials, so you're simulating out different materials. So, so you do select the material. Okay. Right. So, but, but you can just, once you have all the force, you can rerun it with three or four different materials if you want. So you can explore materials and, and the design will look different depending on what kind of material you, you use. So, so that will give you a complete freedom design. And when I say freedom, I'm talking about manufacturing freedom. And so that in general will give you a design that needs to be additively manufactured okay so here's the thing over 90 percent of over 95 percent of all manufacturing is still traditionally manufactured so we also allow you to put in a constraint that says i have to be able to forge or cast this design so that you actually can put in manufacturing constraints rather than just I have this really cool additive additive part that has to run on an additive manufacturing machine. Now, typically, those manufacturing constraints will make it heavier, but will be a lot less expensive. So in today's world, we're, we're giving that engineer the chance to select, is it, you know, do you want to put a manufacturing constraint in or not? In the future, if we start rolling in, this is what it costs to additively manufacture it, this is what it costs to, to traditionally manufacture it, then it's very likely that the software will th can also then put in that cost constraint and can generate, here's the lowest cost, the lowest cost in, you know, aligned with the lowest weight. But we're not, we're not at that point yet. Yeah, the, that's, that sounds like a very interesting a, a, a way to be able to add a, you know, to if you're doing additive manufacturing, you're you're able to save so much on 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 on, on like an ecological um, standpoint and and on a you know on a waste standpoint and all this other kind of good stuff. So adding that to the equation sounds really important. Now, wh w if you if you walk us through this this example. Um, after they've after they've went and added all the constraints and they've and they've went and simulated out that maybe they've played with different materials they've simulated out again what would what would one do with those these are now they have different cat files and then what would they do with those would they try and um, would they tr would they a they will have learned obviously quite a bit on the different permutations that could exist to fill the same need and then are, are they kind of trying to maybe use that in order to say, you know, hey, Boeing, I have a, 
a, a pretty good way of, of, of looking at your bracket that connects the seat to the, to the floor of the plane. And, and because of that, maybe I can get work with you or, um, yeah, what, what would they do kind of in the, in the next steps? Well, it would have certainly made my life easier. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, yes, like so it kind of sort of enhances their capability to sort of make design decision early stage without relying on an expert analysis team to sort of validate whether the designs are a go or no go. Okay. At the very fundamental level, you want to figure out whether these designs are going to work or not work. Validation the, comes right away. The, yes. So the early stage design concepts, so when we say we want to generate smarter early stage design concepts, we want to eliminate all the bad designs that yes. are guaranteed not to pass validation. Yes. And then we want to create enough options to explore the validation step with the expert analysis team. The expert analysis team is going to do a much more sort of uh, involved model-based system engineering analysis to make sure that everything works just fine they'll have f far fewer sort of concepts to play with, which are at least at the base level uh, guaranteed to sort of pass the functionality test. Yeah, that's, that's very, very beautifully explained, just that if you get validated as well at, a, at your first, um, get rid of all of the bad designs that aren't actually going to work in the in the in the in the physical in the physical reality that that's very very important it saves lots of time lots of resources it, it actually like we like you're explaining just the, the learning the learning side of it is is so critical okay now now all right let's let's play on this scenario a little bit longer so um the the we have we have these validated now um, gener uh, generative designs that have come out of, of this process. They're validated. That's yes. Go ahead. Okay, so I want to make a nuance. Yes. So the designs that come out of this process are not validated, but what we've done is we've taken the universe of designs that we know are going to fail and we've taken them out yes. so okay. there's a th the nuance is that um you know we're not saying these are validated designs but we're saying we think there's they're a lot closer to the final design and that should eliminate some of your your back and forth and iter iteration as we went through this process we talked to a lot of companies and they would tell us that they would have anywhere between six and 10 iterations between the analysts and the design engineer to finally get a good part. Mm. And so from their perspective, if they can get down to two iterations, yeah. that is a huge time savings. Yes, yes. And even, you know, and at the end, many of these companies are still using, they're not just using simulation to validate, they're still, making parts and running them through a, a prototype validation phase. And so if you, if you are closer to this, the final part, you save a ton of money on prototype parts and running them through the validation phase because they can get through that phase. So there's still a final validation, yeah. you know, final simulation, final validation that happens but we've taken out a lot of the the thing the known things that will fail through that process. Okay, yeah, that was great nuance. Awesome. Okay, so then so then we're a big part of SciArt is then to be able to move all of the designs that are being made towards the direction of success, towards the direction of um, validation. Um, in, in that direction, at least, and 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 f and through that process, saving people time, money, resources, all that stuff. Um, now, yeah, because you're given you're given all these constraints, like you said, with the forces and the and the look and the and the size and the material. And that way, it if you're going outside of those um, constraints, then there is some potentially creative solutions that the yeah that could be outside of those parameters that then would need to be you know explored with the final valid validation process of maybe this is potentially um, better. So how does let's see if we can have you explain on the on the technical side how the how does this how does your software work with 
the initial design in CAD to make the additional like nine, let's say, CADs? So uh, our software uh, is what we call is add add in. It adds into the CAD tool, um, and as an input from a CAD uh, software, we only require uh, the initial representation of the geometry, like the boundary. You just have to specify what your uh, boundaries of your design space are going to look like. And then uh, the add-in, like our tool, uh, sort of provides you those menu options as uh, any other menu option that you would see within those CAD tools. Using those menu options, now you set up the problem to run on the back end our software that uh, runs right within their ecosystem. It runs seamlessly on their workstation uh, uh, without sort of... Uh, them having to sort of do any kind of a file uh, exchange between one system and the other system. So uh, to an engineer, uh, it would appear that uh, the tools were available uh, as an option within the CAD program. So they just have to learn another menu, but the way the tool behaves is, is still the same. Like the, the uh, designs that are generated, they're generated within their workspace. So then, in addition to in addition to this add in um, component, you said that there is the, the 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 outlining the geometries of where the design needs to be in the in the in the digital three D space. Then, how how do you then let's talk about this? How do you you know you have this like there's forces. Then there's the lo the locations right where it needs to be. So how, so then they would. You you would you would, your add in would then also add those variables, and then your add in would compute the alternative designs. So, our add in gives the engineer to add in those variables. Okay. So how many? Cool. So remind me how many different constraints can an engineer put in on one design? So. Uh Constraints and functionalities, I sort of make a distinction on that. So from a functionality standpoint, uh, there are quantitative uh, sort of uh, constraints. Let's call them quantitative constraints that you have to put, um, such as uh, forces that the design has to support, uh, restraints on the surfaces, uh, maintaining certain surfaces for, uh, um, say, assemblies or sort of uh, spot checks maintaining the references, so retaining boundaries, uh, like an other set of constraints. Uh, that sort of yield what we call as uh, stresses, uh, your displacement, and so, say frequency variables. So uh, these are uh, quantitative constraints, like you can measure them. You have to run a simulation and then you have to measure all of those constraints. Then there are qualitative constraints uh, which do not require simulation, like they require a uh, ray tracing uh, check, whereas uh, the accessibility of the feature, for example. So for casting, you cannot add feature in a direction where it is inaccessible to the cast, because uh, you have to pour the material and then you have to sort of uh, demold it. So like those are qualitative constraints. Uh, maintaining, so extrude directions, that's qualitative constraints. You don't have to specifically run a simulation to sort of add those constraints, but when you're removing material, based on the simulation, you have to be cognizant of those qualitative constraints. Symmetry is another qualitative constraint, so maintain symmetry about a plane, uh, sort of axial symmetry, radial symmetry. Those are additional constraints. So uh, all of these are sort of uh, provided as input yes. using our uh, tools, sort of a tool list or what you menu options yeah. that show up within the CAD platform uh, that interact with the part file that is still sitting inside the CAD sort of uh, software. Yes. All right, so how many external constraints, so forces, restraints, how many? Can I do, can I do three? Can I do four? How many can I, how many can I put in? Yeah, that's right, asking those questions. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so that uh, really depends on how many you want to. Like uh, we can, if you want 10 different sort of uh, constraints based on your loads, we can do 10. If you have 100 constraints, we can do 100. It basically sort of comes down to uh, how much time do you want to wait 
uh, and how much computer resources do you have? <laughs> exactly. So it's it's if you have uncertain like if you want to sort of go granularly sort of m map out a dynamic system sort of for a complete 360 degree cycle say a one full revolution would be like a 360 degree cycle and you want to do it like at every degree you can set in 360 constraints and to uh, manage all of those constraints to do your uh, design uh, exploration and do you usually do you usually have the computation done on the local machine or do you send off the computation no, it's always on the local machine so uh, ideally um, our philosophy is that the computer resources that you have uh, are sufficient to run complex real life problems like the simulation uh, are sim from a simulation capability like we are able to sort of simulate all of these different designs within your uh, system and, then, oh yeah, go ahead. and that's that's part of our secret sauce is that you don't have to be connected to the cloud so from you know because of my GM background, his, his Tata Motors background, we both come from large enterprise backgrounds. And right now, they, they don't want their data going into the cloud. Now that may change in the future, but where, they, where, where, where those companies are right now, and we've talked to really hundreds of engineers who are like, Oh, you're doing generative design, and then we say, and it all runs on your laptop. Oh, I want to talk to you because they have already been told their designs are not going up into the cloud, and so that's that's a non-starter for yeah. for many of the peop many of the companies that that would be interested in this. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a very good point. At the same time, it's also interesting to, you know, as we were just discussing that if you're computing three variables, it can potentially be done locally if you're maybe doing a hundred it might not be able to compute locally this may be this may take too long of a processor it may be done much faster if it's done with a more powerful machine this type of these types of points now then is it then your your proprietary algorithms do the computations of the restraints of the constraints the functionalities that are that are needed that's what SciArt software is doing. As you do the add-ons, then the yes. So they they are doing all of those computations of uh, sort of uh, simulating all these uh, restraints, all these constraints, uh, design by design uh, locally. Yes. And uh, uh, so, imagine. So let's throw a hypothetical. Like you're doing a. Uh, three different scenarios, three different constraint scenarios, and you're solving uh, for, uh, say, 80% material removal, and you would like to explore every uh, design uh, of for like 2% material. For every 2% material removal, you want to see what the design looks like. So we are performing the simulation three times uh, every 2% material removal, all the way sort of removing 80%. So and then it'll fail at some point because, yeah, yeah. Be, be, yeah. Be, yeah, and so, so then maybe what, maybe then what you're trying to do then is you're, you're rem or is this the case you're trying to remove the amount of materials by 2% until you get a failure and then you know what the minimum amount of material you need is for the 100,000 uses or whatever yeah, it may exactly. be. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly, yeah. Okay. Oh, that's so interesting. That seems like exactly what we need to, to, instead of, like you said, this now becomes more about science and the simulations and knowing the, the truth and, um, versus subjectively taking guesses or having to do things, um, long form computations. Um, and it works to have a tool that can just simulate these out much faster. Do you, and then do you have that, you have like an algorithm then that does that actual like decrease by 2% and then check. That's so interesting. That's so cool. Do you have more examples like that where you're like decreasing something like a material by 2% or that you're, um, all of our examples are like that. So any design, exploration that we do we do it so the parameters is like what is the volume that you want to decrease every step and the 
parameters or what are the constraints that you're applying. Beyond that, you can choose to remove material, all like 99% of the material. It's not going to go there. Correct. Yeah. Right. But, yeah. but then what would be another example with what, what would be another example with maybe um, uh, one of the m messing around with another one of the variables like the forces or the attachment points? You know, do you, are those are those for? I mean, like are those a forever constraint or can they be creatively, you know, run permutations to creatively figure out how to make it better? So uh, manufacturing constraints, adding manufacturing constraints will give you different results after every 2% material removal. Mm -hmm. Adding, uh, say, frequency. Like, so if you're optimizing for frequency, uh, the designs that will be generated for every 2% material removal will go are going to look wildly different than if you're optimizing for strength or if you're optimizing for stiffness. So each of these kind of sort of driving parameters uh, kind of give you different exotic designs. And all of those exotic designs are sort of generated uh, step by step. So remove material, cycle through all the constraints that you have, yes. figure out which is the constraint that is closest to failure, and then let, let that be the dictating constraint for material removal for the next step. So it automatically sort of switches between which constraints are important. It also automatically sort of, uh, sometimes it sort of takes too big a step and it fails and it comes back and it sees like if there is another direction that it can sort of go to and sort of remove any more material without sort of violating any of those constraints. So it does all of those adaptive sort of decision making uh, from an algorithm standpoint uh, based on the number of constraints that you've specified. You add more constraints, you get m different designs. Uh, you reduce some number of constraints, and you sort of give it more freedom to explore even further uh, that was not able to sort of, it wasn't able to reach because those constraints were valid in previous iterations. So that, the, yeah. <laughs> this is this is basically um, having me realize that um, all of these ways that we're enhancing the the human uh, design and engineering process is very beautiful and important. But at the same time, it's making me realize that um, soon it will be able to do this on its on its own process. Uh, and th we'll see how long that actually ends up taking and stuff. But um, for now, it will enhance the, the process. It's, and and that may happen a long time down the road. Um, but there's so I, and what I'm going to tell you is there's so many things that need to happen to get to that point. Okay. And, and at the end of the day, you know, working for GM, what are we focused on eliminating waste out of the process, right? And I was in the manufacturing operations. And so the goal, Toyota production system, we implemented that at GM. And it's all about, you know, and waste is included in standing when you're not working. It's, it's, it's throwing things away that you shouldn't have to throw away. I mean, there's a lot of different kinds of waste as part of that process. And what what we would both tell you is there is a ton of waste when you have a design engineer do something and then have to wait. So waste waiting is waste. Okay. Have to wait. Someone else analyzes it, comes back and says this failed mm -hmm. and, and can't even necessarily tell you why it failed. So you take another guess, go back forth, back forth. Yeah. So, you know, the first part of this process is how do you eliminate waste? That way. In, in, the, in that process. Now, the future, we talked about, you talked about the future. We are in violent agreement about the long-term future, but, but the, you know, AI, I mean, we know, it's like a human can look at something and say, oh, there's a problem here, and that, it's a long way away before that comes out of the design process, because that experience of, you know, I look at it, oh, that won't work, but if we just adjust it a little bit, maybe this will work, but, but this kind of software will give you options that the human brain, because yes. it, it just hasn't even thought about. Yeah, we have to sleep and we have to, uh, we have emotions and all that. I mean, it's just, you know, it's, some of these solutions, you look at them and you're like, wow, where did that come yeah. from? And yeah, yeah, the creative potentials. Yeah, yeah. So 
Um, uh, teach us about SciArt Software's, um, n- you know, next steps. Right now, it's the add-in on the CAD. Um, when? What is the next thing? Is is the next thing also the ability to do some of these simulations with the supply chain or with, um, or with the um, with uh, with that with the down the line with the actual uh, process of how difficult it will be to do maintenance. Where did where are the next parts of the? So, um, so current step is with design engineers and a lot of doing pr- uh, traditional manufacturing. So next step is taking this super fast on the desktop capability to do design for additive manufacturing. All right, and I'm going to let you talk a little more about that. So. Uh most of the manufacturing process that we've sort of used as a constraint up until now are kind of qualitative manufacturing process. Like we have some information uh, based on the visual of what a part looks like and those manufacturing processes, based on those visual information and some uh, tabulated information, we sort of uh, enforce those as constraints. Additive manufacturing is a whole different beast altogether. Like the process itself has to be simulated and that simulated process will give you uh, information about the physics of the part that comes out because of the process. Like the process itself changes the material behavior of the part that is being sort of uh, created through AM process. So just to be able to sort of uh, get a initial sort of process simulation done and then bake that into a design decision tree to sort of generate designs that are now going to be more likely to succeed through the AM process and will retain the functionality that you design those parts to sort of uh, maintain in the first place is, is uh, going to be then the next step. So understanding the AM awareness of the design is, is what we are looking at. So then, with give us the, with the um, bracket we were talking about, what would that look like with the uh, the second step of that AM? So, assuming that the assuming that the uh, first step with that bracket, we said it needs to be manufactured traditionally. Well, with AM, um, and, and and I'm now talking specifically metal AM. Uh, if you have angles you have a you build it a certain way and against the build direction so the z height of the build direction if you have an angle greater than 45 degrees you need to design uh supports okay so you can picture i need to do this and the way you set up your build will actually determine what your design needs to look like so you've got your process awareness, and then there's going to be issues around, well, gee, how many are you going to build on a build plate? Uh, and the, the heat interaction will create potential for warping. And so taking all of those build things and putting it into your design software and figuring out not how to do it in the cloud, but to how to do it on your desktop. And that's our, that's our next, yeah. next version. And then as a wrap, let's think on with all of the different transitions that are happening on the like on this massive technological and economic revolution that's going on. In terms of the exponentials, where do you see the most amount of both of SciArt software being able to make an impact as well as um, your specific most interest in what's going on with the exponential tech. Oh, you're gonna make me answer that one, aren't you? <laughs> um, so, we, so there's a couple things. One is um, the, the huge expansion of metal 3D printing is gonna just fundamentally change the way mechanical engineers design parts, okay? And the question is, 
when do you how when do you start getting mechanical engineers thinking about designing parts functionally versus sit down and draw and and we think we're the right tool for today to do that but the future and i'm going to i'm going to actually um i'm going to talk about a vision that joe walsh sh shared with me which is picture that in the very early that that all parts are essentially designed functionally yeah and today we think about here's a model and this is what you build so you build it in prototype you build it in production and you build it for service but if you picture the future is we need something that does x and you have a functional build and you validate the x in prototype and then you move into high volume production and the part looks completely different even though it has the exact same functional capability and you 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 build it one way in production and then as you get down and 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 the part is in a vehicle that's 20 years old and it's it's more towards the end of its service life but it breaks on a vehicle and you need to replace it you may have a third design that meets the same functional requirements, but it looks very different than the part that it's replacing. And that is, that is the promise of generative design, is that, that it's not the part itself that's so important as opposed to the function of what this part does all the way through the long-term life of that product. And so it ties into the digital thread. It ties into it. It ties into uh, uh, the digital twins. It ties into a lot of the industry 4.0. But the ultimate vision is that design will start identifying. Here's the function. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Whoa. Yeah. Damn. That's cool. Yeah. If, if, we're, if we're designing with the intent of, of functionality as the foremost um, importance and then just let all the permutations run and see what, ends, what it ends up being as the most solid one, uh, that's really cool. Yeah. And then that skips out on all of the time that we spend on, on potentially the bad designs. And yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Any thoughts, Praveen, on the last question? Well, I want to build a Dyson sphere. Yeah, yeah, no <laughs> kidding. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So uh, long-term vision, not for the company, but in general, is uh, self-replicating uh, AM processes, mm -hmm. where AM machines are building more AM machines that are building parts that will go and sort of propagate uh, the structures that need to be built uh, before uh, a human can ever sort of go into that space, thinking from a space exploration standpoint. Yeah. But that's a different story altogether. I, I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> I am going to say something yeah. here also, which is this is an exciting time, but it's also a scary time, yeah. right? Because. It's like we don't know what that means to our society. Yeah. We don't know what that vision means to our culture, our society, and even just what people are going to do in the future. But, but you know, when you moved from a pure, you know a, a predominantly agricultural uh, situation with the steam engine, they didn't know either, mm -hmm. and there will clearly be people displaced. And, you know, so for me personally, it doesn't mean I, have, I walk away. I worry about how, how do we societally deal with this displacement, okay? Yeah. And all the technology that's coming that are gonna displace people who have good, solid, middle-class jobs. I don't know where this is going, mm -hmm. but I also know that you cannot stand in the way of where technology wants to take you. And so we're going down this path because the technology is going to go, whether we, whether we do it or someone else. The, the future, I, I absolutely believe, and, and 
his description, that is going to be the future. So it's going to happen, but but you know, being being aware of that and at least trying to understand that this isn't just about the company, this is about the greater yeah. what happens in the world and wanting to be aware and care about that. That would be my final message is it's not it's it's not just about the one thing. It's like there's there's ramifications to us as a society and a global society and I hope that the people who are watching this are aware of that also. Yeah. This is a very good way to wrap. I am very much in agreement. I think there's uh, m mostly a retraining issue that we're facing. I think there's going to be a significant amount of jobs that open up as well in coding, in the IoT world, and all of these interesting, fascinating slots. But that how do we retrain people that we're driving? trucks or cabs? How do we retrain service retail industry people to, to want maybe augmented reality, maybe something that has to do with the brain computer interface world? Who knows? But I think that it is definitely one of the big problems. But it's, a, and it's also a very interesting vision of additive manufacturing, making more additive manufacturing that runs the permutations and makes the best functionality pieces and the limited slots that it can fit in. This is a very, very cool conversation. I'm very happy that SciArts at the frontier of being able to push into this because it saves bad saves time away from bad designs, moves us towards the, the right designs for at younger ages for kids to, to be able to go through this process. Young adults can get in through this process faster. Thanks a lot for coming on to the show, you two. Thank you so much. Thank we you. really appreciate it. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thank you so much. We really appreciate everyone for tuning in. Thank you so much. We would love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you're thinking about about generative design and also give give SciArt a check. Check out their link in the bio below and support the artists and entrepreneurs that you believe in. Support Simulation. All of our links are below. Check out Kofes. Support Kofes. Their links are below as well. And go and build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world, everyone. We love you very much. Thanks for tuning in and we will see you soon. Peace.